Hey everybody, welcome to a little segment I just call Fillmore's Filler. And the reason why I'm uh, recording this and actually posting it is because I have to apologize for the previous week's premiere, which actually was, I'll, I'll take the blame for it, but in actual fact it's YouTube, said it had processed the part three of the summit video that we had recorded, but, and so prior to going on vacation, because I went away for about five days, um, it said it had fully processed, and in the way it works on YouTube is that when uh, a f uh, the thumbnail comes up and it shows that it's processed, uh, it's no longer pending, uh, you can go in and then you can start sharing it with Twitter, sharing it with social media, showing that this is the day it's going to actually come out. And what happened was it showed that, but then when I went into it a day, a night before, I just wanted to see if I could download a copy for myself remotely, and I couldn't. It said it was stuck at 39%, but I didn't know if that was for real or that was just kind of some kind of weird YouTube algorithm that had screwed up. But either way, I saw that... Uh, there might be a problem, but hope for the best. And so when the show didn't actually premiere when it was supposed to, I cut it within the first five minutes to make sure that people weren't where they're waiting, like, what the hell's going on? What's the problem? So I apologize for that. And in the meantime, I'd just like to post this as a little uh, something that I'll do every now and then. It's to address the questions that some people have had for us on Facebook and also some of the questions that people have had in on the YouTube channel as well when they want to discuss just things that um, might be piquing their interest re requests for sh future shows shows that we may have already done and uh, just comments it's also to talk about some comments that they have themselves have been responsible for that are really good and I think deserve to be heard by you the listeners because not everybody has a voice some people are just happy to listen to the show other people would like to um, speak up a little more and we have room for all of you as I said before join us on Facebook our Facebook group is open to most um, if we find out that um, you want to contribute somehow I'm on Twitter as well and I think Sam is as well so you can get through to us through those particular social media applications. So uh, one of the questions here involved our, quite frankly, 79 plus 34 minutes saga from B4010. And they were commenting on something within the recording. And this is the quote, Fillmore is wrong here in my opinion. The wig was not uncomfortable when Robin was saying she was envious of him because of the 60 minutes piece. The wig loves it when people are jealous of him no matter what. It plays into his narcissism. He was just pretending to be uncomfortable, but inside he was rejoicing. Blobbin was right in saying she would be nothing if not for the wig. Peace, Phil and Sam. Well, B4010, I will say that I agree with you in, in one way, that he was enjoying a little bit of her discomfort, but it still made him uncomfortable because she was clearly going to be... There was a potential for her to be more upset than she explained. And he tries his best to do the old two-step and make it about something else and joke about things and try to make it like it's not a big deal. But she's clearly upset by it. And her, her way of explaining it was so incredibly narcissistic that it was almost a character study in both of them. And uh, I think it was fascinating. I think you could listen to that again and again and hear many things differently each time. This next one is from Andre Brinsma. I'm not sure if I pronounced it uh, correctly. Uh, my apologies if I did. And he writes, My prediction for Howard's contract negotiations or options. I agree Netflix won't offer Howie anything beyond what they would offer Eliza, Eliza I don't know how to pronounce her name, Schlesinger, for a comedy slash talk show, if that. Uh, but I think Sirius will dangle some serious cash in front of Wiggy's nose for rat, who knows, for the following reason. Sirius, being publicly a traded company, needs to justify its existence to majority shareholders and board of directors. And by existence, I mean the continued positions and salaries of top management. CEO Jim Meyer makes approximately $17 million per year. How could he justify this if he can't even maintain one marquee A-list star in terms of name recognition for its product? Like you guys, I also think that Meyer's uh, Sirius 
Other top brass and majority shareholders aren't under any illusion that Stern pulls a significant number of listeners, but without Stern, Sirius is pretty much a failed enterprise, a site of subpar content that the overwhelming majority of today's listeners prefer to consume on other platforms. In short, re-signing Stern gives Sirius the appearance of viability as a going concern. Thus, Sirius re-signs the greatest interviewer in the business, trademark, uh, for a significantly decreased sum from five years ago with some incentives built into the contract that both parties will understand will never be reached that will allow Wiggy to triumphantly claim that he's still the highest paid broadcaster in the business. Well, that's a, a bit of a mouthful. I maintain that, no, they don't want him, and they at this point, he they have all they need. They have his archives, which are more important than he is at this point. And I would actually dare to say that even his archives are not that valuable because a the people that really want it most people have it uh secondly there are so many edits that be become necessary with some of the more racier stuff that a lot of it is unplayable if you really marketed it properly in terms of the interviews in terms of the bits that are actually funny but not necessarily offensive um you could have a gold mine you could definitely have a channel there but in terms of like having an A-list marquee star, they would be better off having him do two hours a day, five days a week, than what he's doing now. I I think that would bring in something if he actually started putting in some effort. But I don't believe that the serious experiment did succeed. Someone else may beg to differ. Uh, this, by the way, was a comment under the uh, A Wig for All Seasons episode that we did. Um, but I agree also that the CEOs have to justify their existence somehow. I think this is not how they're going to do it. Um, it'll be fascinating to see what happens in the future with um, the uh, addition of Stitcher. I don't know if this is just something to sweeten the pot for a future prospective buyer to buy Sirius XM outright and do something with it, making it more, I guess, attractive to future buyers. I have no idea. Um, but uh, there's no way they're going to release numbers that indicate he's the highest paid broadcaster in the business anymore. After Joe Rogan, they can't, they can't even get close to that. This is another comment from Akay Lindman. I think I'm sp saying that correctly. And it was based on the I Never Said the N-Word episode that we recorded not too long ago. A forced weak apology from a narcissist that really wasn't an apology. Wonder what his other what were his other options besides the I was insane defense, blaming, excuse me, the alcoholic writers like Jackie for not giving him good material, only racist bits, lack of sleep and poor judgment brought onto him by his family and the work schedule. What a clown! I hope they renew his contract so he has to do these bullshit apologies for the rest of his career. Thanks for the podcast. It makes the Mondays go down a little easier. Well, okay, or okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to the show. We love to do it, and we hope we do it for people who appreciate it, of course. And, yeah, that I, I agree absolutely that he would have been better served pre-writing some kind of proper apology addressing it, but the narcissism in him cannot apologize because, in his mind, he did not do anything wrong. And so, yeah, he is going to blame Daniel Carver. He is going to blame, um, he is going to blame President Trump or, or, you know, Trump's son, or he is going to blame his station manager. He's, it's, it's always someone else's fault. I mean, that's just the way it goes. This is a comment from Vincent Edwards. And this is uh, also from the same episode. Sorry, Howard, you can't change your image. Your wealth and popularity was created with the help of you being offensive and using racist language slash bits. Please, QF, don't let up on his hypocrisy. Love the show. Also, the DMX song he redid twice with the N-word was in the 2000s. Um, yes, I believe it was at the turn of the turn of the century, and he did release it. And um, it, it's, yeah, I mean, the, he can... It wouldn't be much for him to tone down some of the more really blatantly offensive in 2020 bits and still be kind of edgy. The thing is, though, he's too afraid. He's not sure. He doesn't have the pulse on any of anything, so he doesn't know what's going to offend. In this day and age, in a way, I don't blame him. Uh, there are so many, quote, unquote, woke people that it's tough to know where the line is anymore. So... If he was going to go the interviewer route, he should actually study proper interviewers and do his homework, but he never does. 
Uh, this comment is from Beth Baxter, who commented on the, quite frankly, uh, deconstruction of the Miss America infomercial. Uh, and she writes, at the time, I said Howard should fire Ralph for making him look like a combination of Fagan <laughs> and the Mona Lisa on her worst day ever. This infomercial was relentlessly flogged on the radio show as a parody and was the moment where I stopped believing everything that came out of his huckster mouth. Still listened every day, though. Yeah, and and it's a, actually a good comment. I... Uh, you you picked and choose what you you picked and chose what you liked, and it really was like a buffet, and you know just just because it's the same reason some people they would never tune out because of Robin, but they know the show would have been way better if you got rid of Robin a long time ago. One of the shows we released more recently, I believe it was the second last episode, the Who Mourns for a Dumbass episode one. Uh, this is from Argo Vermeer. Yeah, Howie could have probably have technically sold the stupid birthday show to a network. Network sneak crap that filled that 2 to 4 a.m. time slot, but not for any amount to satisfy his overblown ego. Absolutely. I I don't even think he could. I, there's possibly some fly-by-night network that would have bought it, but he was looking for somebody to sell. He was looking for somebody to sell the video version of the show to. And absolutely, you know, using the birthday show as a, you know, you get this in the deal. But no one would have cared about it. And no one cares to finance his horse shit knowing he doesn't bring anything in, to the table. So word of the mouth in the industry gets out like no one's business. When someone is just a, you know, you don't think lawyers talk to each other about cases they've had. You don't think his lawyers told all the story about his trying to see Sue Sirius Ms. failing. And they knew it was a, a lost cause, but they figured, what the hell, it's his dime. But they all probably thought, you know what, this guy... It's not worth it. It's just not worth putting money into him. This next comment is from a guy named Greg Pritchett, and he's talking about the second episode of Narcissistic Personality Disorder we did called You Wanted More Wig, You Got It. This is part two of the Narcissistic Personality Disorder breakdown we did with Bob D. And he writes down, Another great episode. I love the breakdowns. Stern is definitely a covert narcissist. Generally, covert narcissists are awkward people that hold a lot of anger and resentment. This is why the social network with these folks is small. The issue of abandonment is brought up early, and those subtle darts Howard throws are a major part of this. This has me breaking down my own self. Good job, you guys. Well, thank you, Greg. We um, love the narcissistic personality disorder angle. And we'll go to the well as much as we feel necessary, as long as it's entertaining, and as long as we enjoy doing it, and as long as people enjoy it, uh, which there's no shortage of material. That's the that's the kind of the genius part of the um, the archives. You keep we keep finding stuff that we, we may have even heard again and again, but we hear it in different eyes now, in ear sorry different ears. We see things in different eyes that lend more credence to certain diagnoses, if you will. So, and a lot of people during the first, um, in the original channel, when we had released these episodes first, did, especially in the live chat, really was, we were going through, we're drawing these conclusions about people in their lives. And it is fascinating the more you read into it. So I definitely recommend it to people um, as a topic of interest. This one is from uh, the same episode, but this is from Patrick J. And Patrick J is a regular commenter, and he's always very um, incisive, and he always has great things to say. Uh, Artie's best moment as a human being was when he came out on the show as a heroin addict. Uh, to refresh your memories, they had a heroin addict in the studio. I believe they had three or three addicts. I don't know. I don't recall if they were all on heroin. Uh, he was going to be going through withdrawals. Artie gave him some of his pills. Artie in that moment thought of this sick unknown person over his reputation in show business and his current job on the Stern Show. He knew that kid would be in a bad place in the next 24 hours and thought of him over himself. That shows Artie's character as a human being. It's a very powerful moment. From that day, he's uh, from that day on, he's taken shit, always being asked about heroin. I agree. And that's his own fault. No one's going to blame Howard for, for already bringing it up. But there are certain moments in the show where and you, you do feel for him. You do feel that he, the guy's got a heart. It's the drug addict stuff that kind of gets in the way of... It burns people out, and people often get sick of it. It's not uncommon for people to lose just time and lose... Sorry, lose... um patience with any addiction anybody who's addicted to something whether it's booze or drugs or gambling and um they they give up on them 
and it takes a very strong special kind of person to actually put up with it and say look this is the drug is not the person but ultimately um, what draws people to that person inevitably is most likely going to be the fact that they rationalize that person is a good person they are buried in this and you know they're hoping for the best I'm not an optimist I, I, I wish the best for him but uh, I can see why most people would write him off and have written him off uh, this comment is from Jeremiah Smith, who writes in about the part two of the Ablo segment. Can't wait till you guys start doing the 15 Foundations saga. I hope it's a four-part event. I don't think it will be, um, but I could be wrong. I mean, we thought the the summit would be just two parts, but it ended up being three, and really could have been four if I decided I wanted to drop it, you know, make it a little shorter, this last one, and, and cut it into two parts, two, two extra parts instead of part three, the final part. And um, the 15 Round Foundation saga is so vast, it'll take a lot of editing, but when we do it, it'll probably probably take this, the course of two episodes, and two really long episodes, and it will be fantastic. It will be definitely worth the wait, I'm sure of it. So thank you very much uh, for your comments as well. This next uh, comment is from Jay Kelly, who wrote this very recently, and this is on the Spit Roasted Pelican Testimonial train wreck episode. I used to think Beth ain't so bad. She is a skinny little woman that got her hooks into a rich dude. But Sam's impressions of her being exaggerated yet accurate got me thinking I would be super annoyed to be in her presence. Thanks, Sam. LOL. Well, I mean, you don't have to know... You don't really have to know Beth to know that she's anything different than what she presents on all these shows. And when you hear her on Stern, when you hear her do these interviews, when you hear her on talk shows... If if that's the persona that she's bringing forth that she believes is her best foot forward, she sounds like she's the most one of the most obnoxious people on the planet. So if you add wine, I agree. Why would you think she'd be fun to hang around with? And after covering that better half and listening to her get fucked up and uh, make Dana really, I don't. It was just awful uh, the way she treated Dana in that. Okay, this next comment is from the, actually from my other channel, it's on Fred on BG versus Sal, and uh, it's basically uh, the middle of the Sal and Artie fight, and this is from our own very own Raven Alexis, who's very incisive and well-read and smart and a really, just a really brilliant cookie. And she explains here, I absolutely believe the emails written about Artie were done by Howard and Fred to set Artie off on a downward spiral of drugs and anger on the show. It's a passive-aggressive move and cowardly. I also love how Fred spills the beans on Seinfeld dating 17-year-old Shoshana Lonstein and stealing Jessica Sklar on her honeymoon. Then, to top it off, Blobbin agrees with Fred that Seinfeld is basically a piece of shit. And you're right. Um... That would never happen today and couldn't happen because Fred doesn't have a voice. And Howard wants it that way. Uh, as far as the emails being written by Howard and Fred, I don't think Howard has the work ethic to do, you know, bullshit emails and come up with them to uh, criticize Artie. But I believe he absolutely directs um, the back office staff, whether it's Jason or Will, most likely them too. And uh, to get, say, get a hold of the emails and find the most negative ones you want. And he chooses them. And he'll tell you the ones he wants read, they're getting read because he wants, like, they're him. They're the one, he's the one deciding, this is what I want on the air. And it's passive aggressive. He does it in private parts to, um, uh, sorry, private parts to Miss America, actually, with regard to Robin. And I'll, we'll read it when we do the breakdown of that book eventually. And uh, it's nasty. It's nasty as shit. And he's... You know, ducking in cover under the guise of, oh, someone else wrote that, not me. Well, if you're not protecting me, you're the one that wants it out there. This next comment is by, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but Ames Hecate, I believe is correct. He says, people must have listened to Howard back then out of a habit or false reputation based on a couple of outrageous bits. This is the uh, Wig Doesn't Want to Hang Around with Bowie uh, clip on my other channel. Uh, people must have listened to Howard back then out of habit or a false reputation based on a couple of outrageous bits. These are the most boring people to listen to, a bunch of idiots. Left on their own without freaks or born stars, there's nothing. Shows how talented Artie was when he was on the show. He was entertaining. Um, I disagree on some level because they... 
even as train wrecks, there was a certain kind of look at the accident, like look at the look at the uh, cars colliding in real time fascination that people had with it. But also because it wasn't just play the next song, talk between filler. What's the weather like? Play the next song. There was um, I'm not sure I can explain it eloquently enough. There were some good bits, but I agreed. I think more than anything, the big problem back in the day was the advertisements because the ads would back up. He would stack up the ads so much that people would often get to work and not hear any of the show. So if there, if you're going to complain about anything, I would say more along the lines of originally that. And then more recently, yes, once you get a comedian out of the show and start hiring hacks and low budget talent, that's what you get, a low budget show. This is another clip, a really great, uh, sorry, not, not a great clip. This is a, um, from the clip, uh, RG, sorry, sorry, BG versus the Bleeding Deacons, Baby Gorilla. Um, and it was at the Universal Amphitheater in LA. He said, I went to this show, which seated over 6,000 people, and I'm pretty sure it was sold out, just to give you an idea of how Artie, big Artie was at the time. And this would have been, well, 2008, 2009, I'd say 2008, if I can be, 100% sure, uh, or close to 100% sure. The crowd was pretty wild that night. I remember a couple of people getting kicked out. The Bleeding Deacons I only saw for ten, maybe 10 seconds on the TV in the arenas as I was walking in, and they were playing their sets in nuns out, nun outfits with masks on, and it looked like the dumbest thing imaginable. It was great that they played an extra song because I was able to see all the comics. Nick DiPaolo was just horrible. Uh, Greg Fitzsimmons actually did okay and managed to handle a real asshole heckler really well, and by far the best performance of the night was Bob Levy. He was on stage for maybe five minutes max, but was excellent and played off the crowd perfectly. Unfortunately, Artie's set was pretty much the exact same shit you hear on the show. I know in most cases you expect stand-ups to use the same material on talk shows on all their sets, but he knows it's mostly Stern fans listening to him every day at his shows and was just too lazy to come up with any new material. He was so out of shape, but at that time, at that time, that about halfway through, I noticed what would look to be a quarter shining on his belly. By the time his set was over, he had a pancake-sized sweat stain on his belly just from standing. It's incredible how bad his condition was at the time. That's um, cool to hear from people who have actually done these things and, you know, been to the killers of comedy and what have you. Because a lot of people don't go on social media and talk about it. And this wasn't as common as uh, people might uh, imagine back in the day to share, you know, forum stories and blah, blah, blah. So thanks very much for that um, retelling of the uh, event because I've never seen Artie live and I have no desire. I imagine he would be horrible even then because, yeah, um, he's you, you've just determined that he is at his best when he's just riffing off other people. Uh, when he's on his own or when he's got to hold a comedy set, I imagine the best place to see him would be at a, a small club, not a not an amphitheater, which is, you know, rock and roll arty at that time. And last but not least are some requests from a recent thread I posted in our Facebook group, which, as, as I've said before, guys, is a lot of fun if you join up. And that's the easiest way and fastest way to get news about the show there. Although I do post on Twitter as well. Um, Richard Cromwell has requested a history of the Channel 9 shows. And in lieu of that, what we are actually going to do very soon, I hope, uh, definitely in the month of August for sure, uh, Raven, myself, and... Um, Raven, myself, and Sam... Uh, I shouldn't say Raven because I don't know what her schedule is going to be like, but we I know she's definitely down for it. Um, it all depends on getting it together. We're going to do a review, and we've got the audio tapes of the Colford uh, unauthorized biography of um, Howard Stern. We're going to be going through that one uh, very soon, and that one is just going to take a lot of editing and a lot of... It's going to be multi-part because the book isn't that big, but when we do it, it'll take two, three, four, five episodes, and it's fascinating because it does explain the Channel 9 shows in a little, a little bit of detail, but it also goes into the Fox pilots, which by themselves are individual episodes. So I hope to do at least the pilot episode of the Fox uh, show for a walkthrough because it's hideously bad, and I think a lot of people will uh, enjoy it. Um, a couple people, Jeremy Shepard is one, Natalie Panero-Stack is another one, wanted to uh, talk about, wanted us to tackle the Billy West departure and then the time when he had John 
Crick Falusi, I think that's how he pr- they pronounce his name. He had him in studio, and they clearly w- were trying to blindside um, Billy West. And you could tell it's one of the most cringeworthy episodes. I agree. I would like to do that one, and I don't know if that'll be a long episode or not, but we may just walk through that and then talk a little about the history and throw in some other clips of Billy West. But the problem is I have to discuss it with a few people, including George Watson, who's going to get hook me up hopefully with some of the um, more recent Billy West stuff, that Billy still doesn't blame Howard for any of this. And he really, if he does, it's in private. I would love to see him at a Comic Con and ask him outright. He, I like the fact that he's trying to take the high road with some of it, but you can't just blame management because the 800 pound gorilla in the room was Howard, who could have made made sure everybody got what they wanted to make the show better, everybody's happier. Um, and that particular incident was absolutely um, organized to make him feel like shit. And to marginalize him and make him, you know, basically feel like an asshole. So we're definitely going to tra- tackle that one. Uh, let's see. Jonathan Levin, one of my favorite posters when he does post. Howard's part in Artie's downward spiral. How and when he began to make fun of him, not laugh at his jokes and show fake concern, or in some cases, quote unquote, have no idea about his drug use. I listen to old clips and it's so obvious that Howard begins to ignore his jokes, laugh at his weight, show either fake care when he broke up with Dana or mock him for it, etc. Uh, and C.A. Thompson also wants more on this, and that's uh, that was broken down. I, I would love to do this, but there was a guy called Woosh Dishman, I believe his name was, and he did a whole saga that's partially on YouTube. I think I have some of it. The only problem is he was such an awful narrator and, that he filled in the, the clips with in between banter and he's awful he really is awful but he did such a wonderful job compiling all the addiction saga stuff so from like 2005 i would say until Artie leaves so it's six parts it's probably closer to 15 hours worth of audio and it's such a herculean effort that i don't even know we could do it justice in two episodes or three episodes or four or five episodes and it would take so long and take so much work that I think we'd be, first of all, taking time away from doing other stuff that we want to do, and maybe it's a little too hyper-focused. I think if we attack that one bit by bit, we could sort of... Something could be made of it, but then it would take so long, do people lose interest in it by the time you get to part two, because part one was a month and a half ago or two months before. It's a difficult one to figure out how to map out, but if we ever do it, I have all the clips. And um, uh, it's a great idea anyway. Uh, of course, 15 Foundations, a big one. Christy McAllister. Yeah, we're definitely, I mentioned that one earlier. We're definitely going to do this. Um, Ken McKenna wants to know about the whole mad tear, the lie, the Gina Gershon, Rob, Robin Givens, Angie, and Carmen Electra. There's no Carmen Electra story that I know of. It's all him in the shower, blah, blah, blah. That bullshit. Um, and there's not much to that story because all you have is some interviews with them and it's it's all hearsay but we and we've talked about it before um at the old place and even here that it was our belief is the same as yours we they were buckwald well first of all we know that robin givens and angie everhart were and in fact are buckwald clients and whatever the reason he needed beards and that's my opinion and they were cheap and <laughs> I don't mean it in a nasty way, but they were affordable, shall we say. And there was nothing to it. They just He just needed something to cover up the uh, divorce or cover up something. But there's no reason to have those two on the payroll and then have them date this guy. And if they're... I don't know. I mean, they're just... The fact that they're clients makes me think... And they were really, you know, involved with people more infamous than themselves then they're just gold diggers or they were filling some kind of prescription. So, and I think it's more likely the latter. Uh, Another show that we're, we've got the idea to do, first of all, we are going to do the definitive Stuttering John episode. Um, We'll just talk about the, the rise and fall of Stuttering John, which is meant to be extremely neutral, by the way, even though we, we fuck on him a lot. 
Um, we still give him praise for being the only cast member brave enough to actually talk shit about Howard in an actual book and publish it and, um, and talk about it as openly as, as he can within legal, you know, reasons. So uh, I give him credit for that, even though the book is incredibly poorly edited and needs spell check and what have you. But, um, the fact that he went to get a job in LA that was worth way more money than he was making and then... After the divorce, well, divorce, we know what happens to everybody, and I don't want to really, we won't, we won't have any idea why he got divorced, but you can, if you know his personality, you can kind of picture it, you can put your own story together, it'll be just as entertaining as anything we could come up with, but the truth is, uh, it is fascinating that he made so much money and then had to go down to nothing, he's really at Artie's, levels, Artie's level now, although I will give him credit, he since found some kind of footing with this new political format that he's doing and he's getting even though i don't listen to it he's getting a lot more positive feedback from people that do listen to his show so he clearly saw the benefits of not doing howard only uh, material as only he could do it but uh i don't know that if it makes it any more listener but listenable but uh, he's doing something his fans like i guess but we're going to be doing a stuttering john episode at some point. And one of the last one. Oh, Jump the Shark. Yeah, yes, okay. Someone wanted to ask, why did the show Jump the Shark and what caused Cho to change so much? I think for that one, we're going to get people, we're going to, we've got an idea for that. That one's been done before by different places, but um, this is going to be a different format and I'm going to, it's going to require a little editing, but uh, we definitely are going to do one of those. So that's about it for today, guys. I'm sorry for this little bit of filler. I hope it um, it's just a bonus. It's not meant to be an episode at all on its own. It's just throw away. Listen and chuck. Don't review. Review. Give me crappy reviews. I don't mind. And it's not going on the YouTube channel. Um, because It's not going on the YouTube channel as a premiere episode. It's just going to be something we're throwing in there for you to listen to uh, in the interim as well. But don't worry because on Sunday night we have the episode, uh, the part three of The Summit. That's coming up. Tonight we're recording with Bob D, and we're going to be releasing that one in a week's time. And then we'll be recording another one then. So we're, while we're about a week late in uh, our schedule, we're actually, you're still getting the same amount of material, just going to be staggered a little bit in the time that we've promised. So thanks very much, guys. We love you. And um, see you again soon. See you on Sunday for the live chat of the premiere of Summit Part 3. So thanks very, thanks very much to everybody for being um, strong supporters of the show. We love you all, and talk to you soon.